directly from an industry PR expert. Super excited for this. Kayla, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Kristen. So we're in for a real treat today, Latinx creatives. We have Gabrielle Reyes of Reyes Entertainment here with us today, who's a true pioneer in Latin media and PR entertainment. He was personally recommended by Eva Longoria for this program, and we're so excited to have him here today to share more about his experiences in the PR space. So Gabriel actually started out as one of the founding publicists for Latina Magazine and convinced the outlet to give then up and coming actress, Jennifer Lopez, her first feature ahead of that breakout film, Selena. So he's run marketing campaigns and Latino PR for TV shows like Desperate Housewives, George Lopez, Ugly Betty, in addition to working with films for Century Fox and Warner Brothers. So welcome, welcome, Gabriel, to our fourth Thank session you. of Latinx Creatives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me on. We're so happy to have you. So first off, wow, you've had such an impact on crafting narratives and pitching talent over the years. Let's talk about that J-Lo feature first. So back then, the social climate wasn't as open as it is now, especially to diversity, and J-Lo was emerging talent at the time. So what tips did you give her then that helped prepare her for that first feature with Latina Magazine? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really thrilled to be uh, talking to you and also to the TikTok creators, uh, Latinx TikTok creators. Um, with, with regards to Jennifer, I, I had followed her um, and I knew her out here in LA. She, she was a fly girl on that show uh, in Living Color. And then she did a couple of movies, Blood and Wine and uh, Money Train. And I realized that she was uh, beautiful. The camera loved her. And she was um, very much the kind of Latina that I wanted to make sure that we promoted at that time. That means a Latina who was born in the US, who was American, who speaks English as a first language. Because back then, um, really the mainstream media had an idea of Hispanics as being Spanish speaking, uh, foreigners from another country, um, not really American. And so we really wanted to make sure, I really wanted to make sure that she came across as an authentic American Latina born in the United States. And of course, being being herself, not only that, uh, her, the camera loves her, she's beautiful, she's talented. So she was really the, uh, the, the, the epitome, the embodiment of what I really wanted to promote as a new generation of Latinos being, uh, grow, being born and growing up in the United States and being emblematic of what new Americans are about. Um, and so that was, uh, a, my tips to her were be authentic, talk about yourself, talk about your experiences, you know, growing up in the Bronx, being born in New York, uh, but being American first and foremost. So that was, that was the tips. I love that. And how did you convince the magazine that she was the right person to take that big bet on? Like you had mentioned, you know, really drilling home that she is American. This is the new era of what Americans look like. She's from the Bronx, the camera loves her, but how did you get the magazine on board with that? Well, it was easy because the magazine was just beginning. Um, we were really searching for the cover for the very first issue. And I thought this is perfect. This Latina magazine is the first magazine, bilingual magazine for Latina women in the United States. Who could be a better uh, embodiment of that than Jennifer Lopez? Plus, I knew that she was in the running for Selena. At, that, at, that, at the point that we chose her, um, she, the, 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 the role has not been, had not been announced yet, but I was very confident that, you know, even if she didn't get that role, that she was going to really do something. Um, I really saw that in her. Um, and, and, and knowing her uh, personally and having worked with her, I can attest to the fact that she has a fierce work ethic. And she has worked so hard. And I knew that even if she didn't get Selena, she was going to be big. 
And so I, when I spoke with, um, you know, Christy Halbeger, who was the founder of the magazine and the editor at that time, I really drove that point to her. And, um, and so, you know, it was, it was easy. And, um, we were lucky that at the very moment that the very first issue was published, that's the same month that the role of Selena was announced and that Jennifer Lopez received it. And we were the only magazine who had a story about her. We were the only magazine who had even written anything about Jennifer Lopez. And we had her on the cover and we had an exclusive interview with her. So it was a great boon for, not just for the magazine, but also for the, for the movie. And I remember at the press conference when they were announcing the, the role of Selena, I was at the press conference and I distributed copies of Latina magazine to all the press who were there because we were the only magazine, we were the only press outlet that had any story about, about Jennifer. Wow. That's incredible. And I think that also shows the value of having and creating these spaces for one another to really highlight our stories because without Latina magazine that wouldn't have existed. And actually Correct. that ties well with, you know, our last session, we had spoken about America's changing demographics and you touched on that as well. You know, now the Latinx community is roughly 20% of the country, which is a huge chunk. So over the course of your career, how have you seen media adapt to more authentically communicate with this next generation of more diverse, more Latinx Americans? It's, it's actually taken a long time and it continues to evolve even up to this moment. Um, you know, press itself has, uh, is const uh, the media itself is constantly changing. And we've seen um, a lot of the print media has been decimated by, you know, the, 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 uh, the big crop, uh, financial crisis of 2008. And then the advent of social media and the internet also really um, hit print media very hard. And so media continues to evolve even up to this moment. But it was very difficult at that time to convince media, mainstream media, that there was a viable, that there is a viable Latino market, that there is a viable Latino population in the United States that overspends, that over indexes on many, many, um, um, on many items and many categories, and to convince them that not only is a good business to address the fastest growing and the youngest demographic, which are going to become your new customers but also it makes business sense because if you're talking to uh, an audience that is smaller and shrinking, your business is smaller and shrinking. If you take a look at the demographics, you know that the that Latino population is the fastest growing and the youngest um, um, in America and continues to, to be so. According to the US Census, by the year 2060, there's going to be, or 2040, there's going to be um, more people over uh, 65 than under 65. And the, ma the majority of the uh, population growth in the US is driven by Hispanics. So we are no longer a niche market. We are actually the mainstream market, especially when you take a look at young, uh, uh, young people, such as TikTok creators. If you look at uh, middle schools, junior, uh, junior highs and high schools, the majority of students are going to be Latino, especially in some states like Texas, Florida, California, um, you know, Illinois, New York, where we have large, large concentrations of Latino uh, of Latinos. Really, the main consumer in those areas are Latinos, and so the the media in those areas, not just in those areas, but really across the country, needs to really pay attention to who their audience really is and who their audience is becoming and growing, and that is you know, Hispanics. But that was a very hard uh, message to put across back then. It's a lot better now. And we've seen the advent of Latino divisions in different uh, networks and different media platforms, which at first I thought were beneficial, but later on I realized we're really uh, kind of ghettoizing ourselves to say that if a big media company all of a sudden creates a Latino channel just for Latinos, you know, we're really going to be speaking to the to the choir. We, you know, we don't need a Latino division. We need more Latinos in that in that big company, in the big media platform. 
So um, that still continues to evolve, and even up to this, uh, even up to this moment here in 2021, where we realized that you know a lot of media companies have made great strides. You see, Telemundo now has Telemundo uh, in English. A lot of the a lot of the um, um, commercials that they run are bilingual. Uh, both English and Spanish because they recognize the younger generations of Latinos could be English dominant or English preferred. They might not know how to speak Spanish that well, but they are still very proud of their culture and they still want to highlight their culture. So, you know, Telemundo does a good job of bringing those, those young people in, not just in their advertising and their campaigns, but also via their programming where now they have, you know, big studios in Miami here in the U.S. and they concentrate on uh, not concentrate, but they really include a lot of millennials, a lot of young people in their programming. So it's, you know, it's still a work in progress and will continue to be a work in progress because as we see even now, um, the majority of, of uh, decision makers, editors, uh, and publishers in mainstream media are still non-Latino um, and they're still uh, largely male. And so we need to really work on diversifying the newsrooms diversifying media in order to include more women, more people of color, more um, um, gay and lesbian, LGBTQ uh, members, people of the larger umbrella of the of our communities in order to be able to tell our stories organically, with dignity, and in the way that we deserve to be treated by the media, as opposed to the way that we've been treated uh, prior to. Mm. So many gems there, so many gems. And to take things in a slightly different direction, I mean, you've pitched so many talent over the years and you really talked just now about authentically speaking to yourself and resonating with your culture and your community. So a lot of our creators on the call are emerging and they don't have a publicist yet or their team is just a thought, but they're getting to it. So for them, how, like what is a memorable pitch in your mind and what advice do you have for a creative who's kind of doing it all themselves right now and doesn't have a publicist who can kind of tell them, hey, this is how you pitch and this is what makes you good as a Latinx creative, the demographics, like what are your tips there? Well, um, you know, first of all, know your brand. Uh, what is what what is what is it that you do? What is it that you stand for? And make sure that that is a consistent message as you speak to the press. Uh, do your research to the press. You know, when you talk to editors, you know, one of their pet peeves is having somebody call them up and pitch them a story that they don't really um, uh, that, that they don't really handle, like or, or a, a story about something that they don't really write about. So really research, um, uh, research all of the, the, the reporters, the editors. What are they writing? Go back and read their stories. What are they writing? Uh, before you even start to pitch, research all of them. What do they write about? Uh, not, not just their last story, but you know, go back months and years. What do they really concentrate on? And then make sure that you tailor your pitch according to them. So you become a resource for them. If they're looking for something, they, they'll know to call you because you're the person that knows about that. That was one way that I ingrained myself with, um, you know, when I first started because I was a Hispanic guy. You know, there were very few. Uh, now it's, you know, it's really, uh, you know, la uh, Latino outreach and Latino PR is, is, is really part of almost every company. But back then there were very few and far between. So when mainstream media wanted to find out anything about the Latino market, they would call me. I would, uh, so I became a resource for them. And that's because I constantly um, fostered relationships. I was constantly uh, reading about them, uh, getting in touch with them, pitching them something that maybe they couldn't use now, but at least I was on the radar. They knew who I was, they knew what I was, who I was working for. And so they knew that maybe I'm not gonna write about your client now, but I will keep that in mind. So next time I will. Um, so it's important for you to research um, the media that you wanna target. You also wanna take a look at trends. What are the trends? What are the 24 seven news cycle? What are they talking about? How can you make yourself relevant to that news cycle? What can you contribute to that news cycle that is going to be helpful to, to media when they're reporting about some big trend that's going on. Um, um, the other thing is 
you know, of course you want to get your team together and a publicist is very important, but a lot of times maybe you can't afford one, uh, you don't have, you might still want to establish a relationship with some journalists, uh, with some editors, uh, you know, give them a bit of what you do, give them a bit of, of your content, give them a bit of what, uh, of who you are so that they know who, they know about you. And then once maybe you have a publicist, the publicist, the publicist can pitch for you. It used to be kind of a, um, a, a no-no for to have a client pitch themselves. The kind of the case, if you're a big, if you're a big star, you know, if you're Jennifer Lopez, you're not going to be the one calling the editor to pitch yourself. But so you'll have a, a publicist. I can see um, how an editor might be sympath uh, sympathetic to an up and coming uh, content creator that has a good story, that has a good angle on a, on a story, that has something that is of service to the community, um, to still give them a chance and to still um, write about them. So I think really the main takeaway from this is really research. Um, uh, there are many platforms now it's in the advent of internet that allow you to access uh, information about journalists um, and, and really read their articles, read all about them, other than Google. Um, and so, uh, like for example, I, uh, I have a subscription to a, a service called Muckrack, and it is for PR people especially to find, uh, uh, to find journalists, to find editors, uh, to pitch to and establish relationships with. So avail yourselves of any kind of uh, mechanism that you can find that, that will g give you information, in-depth information about um, editors and, and, um, and writers in different media. Also, research the types of media. There, you know, there's consumer media, such as you know, USA Today or BuzzFeed or uh, Pop Sugar, but then there's other media that, is, that are very, very targeted to different industries. So what industry do you fall into? Um, are you a travel, uh, are you a travel TikTok a creator? Do you do recipes? Do you do exercise? Do you, so find the, the press that deals with that industry and also, um, uh, and also research and familiarize yourself with, you know, uh, muscle and fitness, you know, exercise magazine or, you know, food and wine magazine or Condé Nast Say Traveler. Uh, you know, what, whatever your industry is, whatever your niche is, go and find those media that are in that niche and also familiarize yourself. So then that way, you not only can establish a relationship with them, but when you have a publicist, you can be very hands-on in your pitching and you can talk to your publicist. You can sit down and plan out what your plan, your your reach out plan is gonna be. And you can bring something to the picture to them and say, I think we should go after these, I think we should go after this, and I think this should be our message. Because you've already been smart enough to research the press and the media and know how to target them. I love that. And so for our creatives, I'm gonna run some of that back. So research, research, research. So that's understanding the different types of press that exist, making sure you have lists of who the journalists are and follow them across social media. They're all over the place. There's so much information out there. And once you get that information, it helps you understand how to frame your pitch so it's most relevant to them. So another question I had for you is about the pace of press cycles. Things are moving faster than ever. Trends move incredibly fast these days. Yeah. How do you prioritize what to pitch when and how do you also prevent burnout? You know, it's like there's constantly something happening. The internet don't sleep. So what are some of your tips around that? That's right. Well, um, it's always, not for me, dealing with my clients, it's always news, news, news. The, the journalists always want to report something new. They want to be the first to report something new. A lot of times I will offer an exclusive, say to Entertainment Tonight. You know, recently I was publicizing a film and, um, you know, I offered an exclusive to Entertainment Tonight to, uh, to, to air the first interview with a star before anybody else did. Um, so news is important. What's new? What are you doing that is new? Um, also, um, what uh, again? The 24/7 news cycle. A lot of times, I uh, will reach out, and many many journalists, like you said, are on social media, and a lot of them like to be reached out to on Twitter. 
or yeah. uh, some of them don't. So you have to really go through and and not either find out what their preferred method is or ask them what their preferred method is of pitching via email. Most of them want an email. According to the last uh, uh, to the last PR report that I read, the majority of journalists prefer email. Second is social media, and last is telephone. <laughs> they don't want to be called unless okay, they have so that don't call them. Right. Don't it's call so, them. It's email and social media are the number one and number two ways to get in touch with them if you're cold pitching or if you're pitching uh, pitching a story. And then let them come back to you and, and say whether they're interested or not. Don't bombard them with emails about did you get it, did you get it, did you get it? Because they more than likely get it unless you get a bounce back of a wrong email and they just, they're just not um, replying. Many of them don't reply if they're not interested. If you don't get a reply, that means they're not interested. Very few of them will reply to you and say, I'm not interested. So just, if they're not replying, that means they're not interested and move on and go on to the next one. You prevent burnout by really um, giving yourself the space um, to rest. If, you're, um, if you've got news, go ahead and do your pitching, set aside the times, Monday and Tuesday mornings are the best times um, uh, according to uh, journalists that they like to receive pitches. They don't like to receive pitch on Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. You know, especially if it's an evergreen story. If it's news, if it's breaking news, yes, 24 seven, you can reach out to them with something breaking news, reach out to them 24 seven, yes. Everybody's on their email now, everybody's on their social media now. So the whole not five hours really has gone out the window pretty much in terms of media. And I think you know you can always you can always reach out to them if it's if you all, if you already have business with them if they're if you have breaking news. Otherwise, do your pitches on Monday and Tuesday mornings, um, and um, and do them all at once. Like if you have a list of say 10 or 15, 20 journalists that you're reaching out to, um, reach out to them. Don't send email blasts. Do personalized pitching. Personalize your message. Hello, so and so. I read your last story. It was very interesting. I would like to, you know, pitch you this, uh, and I think you might find interest in this story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So make sure you personalize, even if it's going to be time-consuming. There used to be a time that we used to send out a blasts to a hundred journalists with the same press release. Most of them will just throw that away. Most, most of them will just delete that, delete that email because they know everybody else is getting that information and they want to be the first. They want to have some kind of exclusivity or they want to have some kind of personalized relationship. The other thing is data, data, data. Journalists want data. They want to know how your story is relevant to the larger world. What, what, what is, is your story is specific and personal, but how does it relate to to the to the larger world? How does it relate to the experience of other of other people like yourself? How does it relate to the experience of other Americans? So that's also very important: is provide data for data to them um, as to how your story is relevant um, to others. And like I said, in terms of preventing burnout, it's really up to you to decide that this day I'm going to set out. Uh, I'm going to set aside to do my media pitching. And then this day, I'm gonna take off. Um, and by that, I mean, you don't have to not post that day, but that means that you have to prepare and put your videos in a vault, put your videos in a, um, in, in, a, uh, uh, in a queue so that you can schedule, even on days that you're not doing anything, on days that you're giving yourself rest, you still have videos that are being to go out. And so you then when you start to create a cadence, of course, it depends on what media platform you're on, what social media platform you're on, um, you know, the, how often you're going to post. But once you start to create a cadence and a brand reputation, that's when you start uh, getting people interested in you and interested in following you because you are addressing a specific need, you're addressing a specific audience, and they know when to come back to to look for new content from you. Mm, I, hope that, I love that. I hope. 
No, that, those were so many great tips. I mean, one, know that, you know, the reporters want the exclusive, so personalize your pitches. Also, for those of you who were watching and maybe didn't take a screenshot of the communication etiquette, there are also some tips there about how to email and how to send a professional email because that is the number one way to communicate with our journalists. And then also thinking of, again, how you plan ahead. So that way you can give yourself time off and make sure that you take care of yourself because we know this game don't sleep. It doesn't sleep, but you need to. You That's have right. to. And you need to make can sure I you just give say, yourself that place. Sorry, can I just say one thing about emailing? The subject line, the subject line is so important because journalists have, have hundreds of emails that are coming through. If the subject line is tepid, uninteresting, they delete it. But if you have an interesting subject line that makes them, you know, that pops and makes them, oh, this is interesting, what is this, what is this about? And, you know, it's not 10 tips of, you know, 10, 10 travel tips, but it's, you know, it's more like, you know, especially like during these times that there's pandemics, that there, you know, COVID, that there's political upheaval, that there are, you know, other things going on. If, you're, if your subject line gets that, uh, you know, gets catches the interest of the of the journalist relating to these larger trends, then they're more likely to open it. So really think about how important the subject line is, and 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 make sure that the subject line has a call to action. Sometimes you need you know, you you want to say you'll want to read this. You know, if you're sending out a newsletter, if you're sending out you you're communicating with um with with your audience. You know, you 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 wanna you wanna open this, and, and to journalists, you wanna give them a, a nugget of of what they're going to get, but an interesting nugget that really jumps on board into a larger trend that you know they're gonna be interested in. Mm, that's a really good tip because that's kind of like your profile on TikTok. That's the first gateway is that subject line, and so making sure that you craft that in such a way that's enticing and grabs attention, right? Is is really, really important. That's such a good tip. Well, I know we're out of time and we went a little bit over, but this was such a good conversation. I know I learned a lot. I know they learned a lot. It was such an honor to speak with you, Gabrielle. This was really such a treat for all of us. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you all so much. And I hope you all took away and happy posting, happy influencing. <laughs> yes. And with that, we'll say it. Ciao. Thank you. Adios.